time to learn some more rules for differentiating. These two rules in section 2.3 are called the sum and difference rules. And these ones will become so matter of fact that you won't even think about them anymore. The power rule you will think of over and over and over. The sum and difference rules will just become second nature to you. Okay, so let's go through them quickly today. Um, so the sum rule, if both f and g are differentiable, so you can take the derivative, derivative of each one of them, then so is f plus g, and f plus g, taking the derivative of f plus g, is equivalent and equal to taking the derivative of f and adding the derivative of g. The other way we can express this, this means exactly the same thing. If you're taking the derivative of f of x plus g of x, what you could do is take the derivative of f of x and then add on the derivative of g of x. Okay, so in words if we want to say what this means, this means that the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, right? Here we have the, the derivative of a sum and it's the same as the sum of two derivatives. In this case the two derivatives are f prime and g prime. Almost exactly the same thing as that is the difference rule. It is that the derivative of a difference is the difference of the derivatives. So if we have a difference of f minus g and we want to take the derivative of that, that is exactly equivalent to taking the derivative of f and subtracting the derivative of g. The other way you could write that, d dx of f of x minus gx is the same as d dx of f of x take away d dx of g of x. Okay, simple as that. So let's do a few examples. Let's look at this one first of all. We have two different terms here. Uh, so we're going to use the sum rule. And the sum rule says if we want to take the derivative of this whole thing, we can actually do this by taking the derivative of the first term and then derivative of the second term. So I'm going to do this in more steps than you'll do for sure. You'll get to the point where you can do this in one step. But I just want to show you exactly what's happening. In order to get the derivative, we are taking the derivative of the first term, 2x to the fourth, that's a 4, and then we're adding the derivative of the second term, which is root x. Now, before we proceed, let's actually think about this for a second. We have a constant right here. So again, you've probably stopped doing this, but I'm just going to show it once today. We could use the constant multiple rule, which says when you're taking the derivative of a constant, you can just move the constant out front. So I'll move the constant out front, and then I'm taking the derivative of x to the fourth. I know it's impossible to read up here. I'll try to do better. And we're going to take the derivative of root x, but we might want to write that in a different way, right? Instead of writing root x, let's write x to the one-half. Okay, let's finish this off. Uh, we're going to take the derivative of x to the fourth. How are we going to do that? We're going to do the power rule, right? So we've got our two. The power rule says we can bring the four down, and then it'll be x to the third. You have to drop it by one, so it goes to three, plus power rule again here. Going to bring the one-half down. down. Uh, we're just left with x, and we have one less than one half, which is negative one half. And now all we have to do is simplify. We have two times four x cubed, which is eight x cubed. And then what do we have on the top here? Nothing, just a one. And then on the bottom we have a two, and we have x to the one half, right? This is a flip and negative, goes to the bottom, becomes x to the one half, but x to the one half is the same as root x. Remember I told you last day that many people just memorize that the derivative of this, root x, is the same as this, one over two root x. So, you know, maybe you're at that point already, and in which case you didn't have to do all this. But this is our answer right here. So basically what you're going to do today is the same thing you did last time, just multiple times. We just learned two rules that tell you you can take the power rule here, power rule here, power rule here, power, right? You can do whatever. So that's exactly what we're going to do. This one's even faster than the last one. We have g prime of x. We're going to use some difference rule because we have a couple of takeaways. And we're also going to use the sum rule. So all we have to do is take the derivative of each one of these and we'll be done. How are we going to take the derivative of each one of these terms? power rule. So 4 comes down, multiplies the 6, and you have 24. x, it's not going to be 4 anymore though, it's going to be 3. 
3 comes down, multiplies the negative 5, you get negative 15. x, 3 goes down 1 to 2. Uh, if you want to think of it this way, the 1 comes down and multiplies the negative 2, so you still have negative 2. And then x goes down 1 to 0, what's x to the 0 equal to? Anything to the 0 power is equal to 1. So you just have negative 2 times 1, or just negative 2. And then plus 17. Oh, here's one of our other rules, the constant rule. What's the derivative of a constant like 17? 0. So don't put plus 0 there, it's not necessary. Uh, this is your best answer in this case. Okay, a couple trickier ones here. Now, we will learn how to do this without expanding. We're going to be introduced to a very important rule in a few more days called the chain rule. And the chain rule um, will help us deal with this without expanding. But in order for us to do this uh, right now with the power rule and the sum rule and the difference rule, the only way we can do it is to expand this. So remember, first of all, I'm just going to write it up here, that x minus 2 over root x squared is the same as x minus 2 over root x times exactly the same thing, x minus 2 over root x. So let's expand it out. I'm not taking the derivative yet, I'm just still writing y equals. So I'd have x times x, which is x squared, and then I'd have x times 2 over root x, which is, oh, what the heck, I'll write it all out, negative, because positive times a negative, 2x over root x. Then I'd have exactly the same thing when I multiply this, another negative 2x over root x, and then I'd have negative 2 over root x times another negative 2 over root x. Well, negative times negative is positive. On the, in the numerators, 2 times 2 is 4. And on the bottom, root x times root x is just x. Okay, we can still combine those two middle terms. So we have x squared minus, we have common denominators, and you know that the denominator just stays the same. And on the top, we have negative 2x, take away another 2x, which equals negative 4x. So negative 4x and I have plus 4 over x. Okay, we're still not able to um, solve this middle term using the pro uh, product rule, sorry, using the power rule. We could use the quotient rule, which we'll learn in two more days, but we wanna do it with the power rule. So how are we gonna do this? Well, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to simplify this. So I have the four. Uh, I have x here, I have root x there. What's x divided by root x? You know what it equals? equals root x. Another way you can think of it, if that's confusing to you, x over root x is the same as x to the 1 over x to the 1 half. And what can you do when you uh, have the same base and you're dividing? You subtract the exponents. 1 take away 1 half is 1 half. So you end up with x to the 1 half, which is actually the best way to write this. So why don't I do that right now? So I'm hoping that makes sense to you. Think of it this way if you want. What do you have to multiply root x by to get x? by another root x. So that's why you get root x, and root x is the same as x to the 1 half. Okay, for this last term, we should also rewrite it. We want to have 4x, so what would our exponent have to be in order to get 4 over x? It would have to be x to the negative 1, making a flip a negative and you're good. Okay, now we can use the sum and difference rules along with the power rule to figure this all out. So we're ready to do y prime, the derivative. Okay, first one, two comes down, you get two x, x drops down, or, sorry, the two drops down to a one, we're finished. Next one, one half comes down and multiplies the four, one half of four is two x, and then we have to do one less than a half, which is negative one half. And the last one, negative one comes down and multiplies the positive four, you get negative four, and then you get x to the negative two when you drop it by one. Let's clean this up and we'll be finished. First term is good. Second term has what on top? A 2. What's it have on the bottom? It has x to the 1 half. Well, x to the 1 half is the same as root x. And the last one, what does it have on top? 4. What's it have on the bottom? x to the negative 2 flips down into the denominator. You get x squared in the bottom. And there you go. Now, as I said, we are going to find another way to solve this using the chain rule, but it's nice to know this works for now. And to be honest, the chain rule is really not much easier than what we did. So it's good to know this. Next one, we're going to learn another rule in a few days called the product rule. So we could solve this with the product rule. We don't know the product rule yet. We want to get uh, use the power rule. So what we're going to have to do here is, any ideas? You're going to use the distributive property. You're going to expand this out, and then you'll be able to use um, the power rule. So in order to do that, why don't we write all these terms with rational exponents. So square root of x is x to the 
one half times x to the this first term here would be four over five minus x to the three over seven and we're ready to solve, to uh, expand. We're not taking the derivative yet. So we're going x to the one-half times x to the four-fifths. What's our rule when we um, multiply and we have the same base? We add. So whatever one-half plus four-fifths is, that'll be our first term. We'll figure that out in a second. Then you got to, So what we did right there is this times this. Now we're going to multiply this times this. So positive times a negative is a negative. x to the... Okay, again, we're multiplying. We have the same base. You gotta add these exponents too. One half plus three over seven. Okay, here we go. F of x equals. Okay, we need a common denominator of ten. So we would have five over ten and eight over ten, right? So for a total of thirteen over ten. That makes sense. Multiply by five and five, multiply by two and two, you get five and eight. Five plus eight is thirteen. Okay, for the other one, we get common denominator of fourteen. Multiply by seven and seven, you'll get seven here. Multiply by two and two, you'll get six. So seven plus six is 13 over 14, because our common denominator is 14. Okay, we're ready to take the derivative. How are we gonna do it? Well, we're gonna use the difference rule, which says we can just deal with each of these terms individually. How are we gonna do each one of the terms? Power rule. So we take this uh, exponent down, and you get 13 over 10, and add the x, we have to subtract 1 from this. Well, 1's 10 tenths, so 13 tenths minus 10 tenths is 3 tenths. Minus, bring the 13 over 14 down, x, we've got to subtract 1, 13 over 14 minus 14 over 14, which is negative 1 over 14. Ooh, I wish that wasn't negative. You know why? Because we're not really big fans of having negative exponents. So for the first one, we can keep it exactly the same. 13 over 10, x to the 3 tenths. I don't think it's really um, necessary to turn this into the tenth root of x cubed. You can if you want, it's not wrong at all. Minus what's on top, 13. On the bottom, you're going to have 14. You're also going to have x to the 1 14th, or of course you could write that as 14 times the 14th root of x. That's fine as well. Okay, so this is our derivative in this case. Nice. Just one question to go, which is nice. The only problem is it's a really big question. So uh, let's get going on it. Find the equations of both lines that pass through the point 2, 9. I'm just going to go ahead and put that point on here right now. Now, 2, 9. So this is our point P. And our tangent to the parabola y equals 2x minus x squared. Provide a sketch of the parabolas and the tangents. Okay, I guess we better start by uh, sketching this parabola right here. Um, there's different ways you could do it. Uh, one way you could do this, like you could definitely use negative b over 2a, I know a lot of you like that. You could also do this by finding the x-intercepts. You know how you do that? To get x-intercepts, you put 0 into the y. Let's factor this side. We could take out an x, end up with 2 minus x. Okay, use your zero product property. If this times this bracket equals 0, what does x equal? Well, in this case, x would equal 0. And in this case, x would equal 2. Those are your x-intercepts. There's one at 0, and there's one at 2. Now, what we want to find is the vertex. So you should be able to tell me what the x values of the vertex, because there's symmetry in the parabola. So if it goes through 0 and 2, the vertex must be somewhere along 1 here. Great. So what we can do for the vertex, we know that 1 is the x value. Then just plug 1 into here. 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 squared is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1. Oh, our vertex is at 1, 1. I sure hope this parabola f opens downwards. Yes, it does, because look, we have negative x squared. That negative means it opens downward, and it has an a value of negative 1, which means we can just use the basic step pattern. Over 1, down 1, over 1, down 3, over 1, down 5. Symmetry on the other side, we'll go here, and we'll go here. We've got our parabola. If you got a little confused there, remember that the parabola, although it's written this way, it's the same as y equals negative x squared plus 2x. That's how come I know that the a value is negative 1. It opens downward and it has the basic step pattern. So what we're interested in, it says, we want to know the um, equations of the tangent lines to this parabola that go through p. So I'm going to try to draw those here. 
So that's approximately one of them. It goes through the point P and it's tangent to the parabola. Can you picture the other one? Okay, again, I did the best I could. It goes through P and it's tangent somewhere around here at the parabola. Okay, we want to get the equations of both of those black lines there. Okay, let's just look at one of these tangent points. There's one there and I don't know, one here or something, right? I'm just guessing. I'm sure they're a fair bit off than what they really are, but it doesn't matter for me to draw them accurately because all I'm going to name that point, since I don't know what the point is, I'm just going to name it x, y, okay? And I know this point here exactly. It's 2, 9. So if I want to get the slope of this tangent line here, and you can also use the same formula for this tangent line because I could also have called this one x, y, right? So if I wanted to get the slope of this tangent line and I know two points, how can you do that? You know how to get the slope when you have two points. The slope of the tangent is going to be equal to, well, slope is the same as change in y over change in x. So change in y, that would be y minus 9, right? Your y2 minus y1 and then x minus 2. But wait a minute, we know what y is. y is this right here. So what I can do is actually plug that into this y and get 2x minus x squared minus 9 all over x minus 2. So that's one way we could represent the slope. But there's another way we could represent the slope of the tangent at this point right here. Come on, slope of the tangent at this point? What must we be talking about? We're talking about the derivative, the slope of the tangent, is also equal to the derivative of y. And taking the derivative is very easy. If this boxed bit here, the derivative of this first term is 2. The derivative of the second term is negative 2x. How did I do that? Just the power rule. So since this is one way of expressing the slope of this black tangent line, and this is another way of expressing the slope of that same tangent line, what do you know must be true about those two things? About this and this. They must be equal to each other. So we can say 2x minus x squared minus 9 all over x minus 2 has to be equal to 2 minus 2x. And all we have to do is solve that. Now, I know you guys always hated solving rational equations last year, but we just got to do it. So we got to get rid of this denominator. We don't want to solve these equations with denominators. Let's multiply this side by x minus 2. That's great, because it cancels this out. But you can only do that if you also multiply this side by x minus 2. So that is our strategy here. On the left-hand side, we still have 2x minus x squared minus 9. On the right-hand side, got to do distributive property. You get 2 times x is 2x. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 2x times x is negative 2x squared. Negative 2x times negative 2 is plus 4x. Now, we want to get all our terms to one side, and we want our x squareds to be positive. So we should move all these ones on the right over here, because that will make the x squareds positive. Because if we add if we add 2x squared and add 2x squared, you're going to end up with x squared over here. You've got 2x and 4x, which is 6x. But we're going to bring that 6x over and subtract, so you're going to end up with negative 4x. And we have negative 4. We're going to add 4, and you're going to get negative 5. What's left on this side? Absolutely nothing. Hey, this is looking good. What are we going to do now when you have a quadratic and it's equal to 0? Factor, and you can definitely factor this. So x and x, two numbers that multiply to 5 and subtract to 4 are 5 and 1. So drag that one down to get that sign. A negative times a positive equals this one. Use your zero product property. Either this bracket equals 0, which would be if x is 5, or this bracket equals 0, which would be if this is negative 1. We're doing very well. Now, these are just our x values. So remember, we're trying to find this point and this point. We know one of those points has an x value of negative 1. Obviously, it's that one. Hey, I was pretty close. The other one has an x value of 5, so I was way off for that one. The tangent point's actually way down here. It doesn't matter. My diagram wasn't meant to be accurate. It was just supposed to help us picture it a little bit. So we got to get the y values. So let's put our point is 5 comma something, and our other point is negative 1 comma something. How are we going to get it? Well, we're going to plug 5 into this box in here. I don't know if you want to draw a line from each one of those that goes all the way up there and then say plug in or something. I'm sorry, it's so messy. But um, that's what you're doing. You're plugging into here with those values. So if I plug in 5 here, I get 2 times 5 is 10, minus 5 squared is 25. 10 minus 25 is negative 15. 
And then if I plug negative 1 in there, I get 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. Uh, negative 2 take away 1 is negative 3. We're very close now. What's the actual question asking us to do? Find the equations of the lines. In order to get the equations, you need a point, which we found. We found that this point right here is uh, negative 1, negative 3. Hey, I was right on. That's awesome. And this one was 5, negative 15. Whoa, I wasn't even close. It's way down here. Doesn't matter. So we have our points. But the other thing you need to write the equation is you need a slope. Now, do they have the same slope? Obviously not. These two lines have different slopes. How are you going to figure out the slope? Remember? slope of tangent. You can actually plug it in here if you want, this big one here, but what would be easier is to plug it into this one right here. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so I don't know, you could also be drawing some lines, I mean this is just too messy, but you could also draw lines here to show you're going to plug into this, uh, plug in to get the slope as well. Hope this makes sense. Uh, so we're plugging 5 into there. So 2 minus 2 times 5 is 10, 2 minus 10 is negative 8. So in this particular question, the slope is negative 8. For this particular tangent, I should say, this one here, yeah, that's a negative slope, so I'm glad we got a negative for that one. Sure hope we get a positive slope for this one, because that looks like a positive slope. So let's try. Put negative 1 in here. Negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2, so you get 2 plus 2 is 4. Yes, sir, we did get a positive slope. So we're now ready to get our equations. Of course, we're going to have to do it twice. We're going to have to use slope point two times. So let's do this one first. I have y minus y1, so that's going to be y plus 15, equals m, that's negative 8, and then x minus x1, so x minus 5. Okay, so y equals distributive property negative x, negative 8 times negative 5 is plus 40, bring the pause of 15 over, it becomes minus 15. So in slope intercept form, we have negative 8x plus 25. But of course your book's like, book likes it in general form, so let's move everything over to the left hand side. 8x plus y minus 25 equals 0. That is the equation of which one? This one. This, uh, this is tangent line right there. That's the equation that goes through this point, and it's tangent to that parabola. Okay, let's find the other one. So again, slope point form, we're going to go y minus y1, so that would be y plus 3, equals the slope m, which is 4, and then x minus x1, so it's x minus minus 1, or x plus 1. y equals, expand, 4x plus 4, bring the 3 over, minus 3, so y equals 4x plus 1. That's great in slope intercept form. That's exactly what it looks like. Goes through 1, has a slope of 4, yes. But we want it in general form. Let's move everything to the right this time. So we have 4x minus y when it moves over, plus 1 equals 0. I'll just put the equal 0 on this side. And we've done it. We've found the equation of both of those tangent lines. Mm -hmm.